Thank my fan club uh, first. Uh, I'm not talking about VLC today, but I will be talking about UPipe, which is a brand new project that we call a flexible data flow framework. Um, so what is it? Um, it's a framework that allows you to build pipelines, uh, pipelines of data processing um, from uh, data sources to data things. Uh, one or several sources to one or several things. When I'm speaking about data, uh, I mean essentially uh, pictures and sounds because we're in the multimedia business. Uh, but uh, it can be uh, suitable for any kind of data that has a notion of frames or packets. Um, so uh, the pipeline is composed of modules that we call pipes. Uh, and UPipe is a framework that defines APIs that allow you first to configure the pipes. So typical configuration commands would be um, send your output to this other pipe. So that is the UPipe set output commands. Or open this file for reading or writing. Uh, there is an, a an API to feed data into the pipe. This is a packet, process it. Um, UPipe also defines an API to um, uh, allow modules to throw um, events. What I call event is, um, for instance, well, the, f the end of file is reached. What do we do? Or there has been a fatal error. Uh, what do we do? Should we terminate the application now? So that's, that's the kind of event a module can throw. And so we have an API to catch that. Um, we also have an API that defines what a buffer is um, in an efficient manner. I'll come back on that later. And it allows also to um, to um, give attributes to each buffer, arbitrary attributes to each data buffer. And uh, finally, there's also an API that allows to interact with an event loop. I'll come back on that later as well. Uh, UPipe is also a distribution of standard um, basic pipes. Uh, and we'll see a list uh, in, at the end of the presentation. So what could it be used for? Uh, well, we're in the multimedia business and the company I work for, Open Headend, uh, who develops UPipe, um, is selling uh, well, broadcast equipment. So that would be typically transcoders, multiplexers, uh, playout systems, uh, mosaic systems, where you can have several video uh, sources uh, inside one uh, output. Uh, and also we've worked on embedded platforms uh, to make embedded uh, demonstration platforms or embedded media players. Uh, the framework is very lightweight, so it's quite adapted, uh, quite suitable for that. Um, the question you're probably asking uh, right now is why yet another uh, multimedia framework now in 2014? Isn't there already something that exists for that? Well, uh, yes, there is. Um, there is VLC that I know pretty well. Uh, uh, there is GStreamer, of course, uh, MLT framework, and probably other uh, very valid open source projects. Uh, however, um, most of these projects are at least uh, 15 years, years old. And there have been well, new trends uh, that emerged in that, since the times have been designed. In particular, um, well, there is a generalization of superscalar architectures. Now, uh, all CPUs have several cores of execution. Even your cell phone has two or four cores. Um, so the framework has to provide ways for applications to take advantage of several cores if needed. Um, also, a new trend in the um, well, development industry is in what we call event-driven loops or asynchronous programming. Uh, that's something that's been introduced with LibEvent or LibEV uh, for web servers initially, something like Nginx. And it's a technology that allows you to register events, uh, like I want to be notified when there's something to read on that socket or I want to be notified when that timer expires, and you will get called back by the framework. And so this is, well, kind of a new way of programming applications. Uh, actually, it's been generalized for the, in the past 10 years, and the multiple frameworks need to take that into account. Um, also, uh, in existing multimedia frameworks, maintenance is made more difficult uh, because of lack of modularity um, and the complexity of the modules. For instance, a transport stream DMUX in most frameworks is just one module. So you have just one uh, entry point that you configure. In UPipe, if you look at the source code, we have like 10 modules to implement a TSDMUX, one for every uh, DVB table and so on. And so you can arrange um, and fine tune your TSDMUX as you like. 
and also maintenance seems more difficult because of the confusion uh, in some of those frameworks between uh, what we call data processing and decision. What I call decision is um, deciding uh, which elementary stream I want to decode. I want French audio, I want subtitles, not. Um, and which path, which modules do I instantiate. Most of the time this is done either by the modules themselves or the framework itself and we think it should be the task of the application. Um, so we've designed the API to allow the application to get events uh, from the modules and do the decision part itself. Uh, also, um, well, I'm in the professional broadcast world and the um, problem we have with most multimedia frameworks is that um, they've been designed for one kind of application which is um, please play this file. Uh, and uh, use a uh, display output, GLX or whatever. Um, and um, sometimes we do want to access lower level APIs, uh, like to do transcoding with uh, fine tuning, and generally it's more like a hack into the framework. So uh, UPipe has been designed for that kind of, uh, of um, use case. Um, so we started writing UPipe only two years ago. Uh, with new policies, uh, so we've decided to specify it bottom up. Usually, you you specify the API top down. That is, this is the the API I want to expose to the application, and then I go down and try to find uh, the simplest data structures. We did the, the contrary. We ask ourselves, what is the simplest uh, structure that could represent a module, a pipe? What is the simplest structure that could represent a buffer? And then we build on top of that layers of APIs. And so different level of APIs are possible with new pipe. You can talk to the lower level API, which we currently mostly use, but you can imagine a higher level of APIs as well. We try to keep modules as simple and autonomous as possible. That's the Unix philosophy. Um, and that allows us to do very intensive unit tests, including um, uh, check for memory leaks with Valgrind. All our code goes through Valgrind. Um, we also have an emphasis on documentation. Probably if you've seen our website, you can see we have tutorials. Uh, and not only Doxygen, but also um, a comprehensive documentation on the frameworks. And one last thing that is very appreciated um, by professionals is that we try to follow standards as much as possible. We do not aim at playing every single poorly encoded file. Uh, if a file is, not, is encoded and does not follow the spec, well, we may not play it, and we're happy with that. Um, so for the licensing, uh, we tried a very uh, aggressive approach. The core is under the MIT license. Uh, that's as free as, you, as can be. You can use it even in, uh, in proprietary applications. Some modules are under GPL or LGPL uh, license. So how do we compare against uh, existing frameworks, older frameworks? Um, at first glance, we are lower levels uh, than most of them. Um, because the application can really decide how to design um, the pipeline. It, the application decides where to put threads, the application designs where to put buffering queues, and so on. Uh, we have a unified API for all kinds of modules. We don't have an API for sources, an API for sinks, an API for filters. We have the same API for everybody, uh, and that's uh, thanks to a component that's called UPump um, that allows to uh, in fact, it acts as a wrapper around a library like LibEV, which is the one we use currently, but it could be adapted to glib or any other kind of event loop library as well. And, um, well, it, it may sound funny at first to hear that, well, there's nothing in UPipe to spawn threads or to handle multi-threading, but we, we manage the uh, superscalar um, uh, use case by having a lockless or weightless data structures. All our structures are lockless. We have lockless lethals for, data, for buffer pools. We have lockless FIFOs for queues. Um, so the framework is optimized for superscalar architectures from the start. Um, also, we make a, a big use of uh, atomic intrinsics um, that allows us to do atomic reference counting. Almost all our structures are reference counted, so you don't have to, to care about when to release a structure. It's done automatically when the ref count goes down to zero. The structure will be deallocated and deinitialized. 
uh, that also allows us to implement copy and write buffer semantics. So we can have the same buffer that is in different stages of the pipelines, different branches, for instance, of the pipelines, without having to copy the data. The data will only be copied if it must be modified. So that is, that is something we have had from the beginning as well. We also have uh, zero copy uh, semantics. That is, you can build buffers from, single, from smaller pieces of buffer, saying this picture is made of 100 TS packets. And the API allows to, to build this buffer out of 100 TS packets without copying anything until the end, until you need to have it uh, in a continu contiguous buffer. So I talked about attributes. Um, what we call attributes is uh, a triplet uh, name, type, and value. So the name can be totally arbitrary. We have standard attribute types like dates, timestamps, presentation timestamps, decoding timestamps, durations. But you can define your own attributes and, um, and attach them to, to, to buffer at any time. And it will be propagated throughout the pipeline. So that's an interesting feature also. And lastly, a uh, very interesting feature uh, is that you can dynamically build the pipeline uh, when you catch events from, from modules. For instance, you can catch an event that says, hey, from now on, I have a new elementary stream. I have a subtitle stream, for instance. And the application can catch th that event and allocate a part of the pipeline that will deal with it, or even modify um, another part of the pipeline to, to do something else, because there is uh, something that happens. As long as you're in the same thread, uh, you can modify the pipeline any time you want, so it's quite dynamic. So that was on the upside of uh, the project. On the downside, you must understand that this is a very young project. So that means that we have fewer modules than uh, existing fr frameworks by far. Uh, in particular, we have no support for hardware decoding or hardware encoding. Um, and we also have fewer users, so fewer people who test. Um, I have to be completely honest with that. So about the status, um, we've just released uh, what we call UPipe preview release number two. Um, we're quite happy with the API and we have no plans to change at least the module level and the application level API for the moment. We may want to improve uh, the API by adding new calls that will make uh, application developers' life uh, easier. But it's quite a good starting point if you want to have a look at it uh, and start developing for it. Uh, there are already many modules that are available. Um, from, from external libraries, we have support for FSMPEG slash libav. We have support for X264. Uh, and we have a few native modules, in particular TSDMUX and TSMUX. This is our core business. Um, and everything that you need to read a file or to read uh, streams from UDP or HTTP and so on. And we have utility modules such as DUP, which allows you to do, put a branch in your pipelines, a trick play or digitering of data, and queues, of course. Uh, I would like to end the talk with a few examples. So this one is an example of um, well, the G GLX Play uh, uh, example, uh, it has three threads. The main thread that is running the GLX um, uh, module, and it has one source thread that reads data from the network and from the file, and one thread, decoding thread, um, that takes data from uh, the source and decodes it um, to, to, add, to output it finally. So you can see the use of queues here, uh, one queue after the source thread and one queue after the uh, AV codec thread. Um, you can design it the way you, you, you want. Um, we have no problems with frameworks who require you to do all your outputs in one thread. For instance, the PP API of Chrome requires you to have all your outputs in one thread. Well, it's not a problem. You can have queues that will bridge all buffers to one single thread and output them from this thread. Uh, you can really build the pipeline as you want. Finally, this is an example that is a bit more complicated. Uh, that's a, a real application that runs in our product, that we call it Record Hash. It's a program that does uh, four, four things at once. Uh, it receives a UDP streams uh, that's on top of it. Um, and it, first, it writes uh, the buffers to the TS buffers uh, to the disk. So that's a data sync on the, on the left. 
At the same time, it writes the reception time of each buffer to an index file that the aux sync on the, on the right. Uh, this file allows you to play, replay this, uh, the stream exactly as we received it for time shifting purposes or debugging purposes or whatever. And the big blob in the middle uh, instantiates TSDMAX and a decoder um, that allows us to do two things. First, uh, we have a JPEG sync, so we um, write thumbnails of the stream on the, on the fly. And um, also we have hash sync, which writes fingerprints um, that uh, allow us to do well, quickly um, frame detection on, on the stream. So all of this runs in three threads that are not symbolized here in the schematic, but um, it's something that would have been very difficult to do in many other part, you know, frameworks. So um, to summarize, uh, we would ask you to keep in touch with us. We have more information on our website. We are also 24-7 uh, on IRC on Freenode. Uh, we have a mailing list, and I have booked tomorrow um, a both room uh, at 2 o'clock. Uh, it's a meetup, so if you're interested, you can ask your questions here. I'm not sure we will have many time for questions, but if you have questions, you can drop by tomorrow at 2 o'clock, and we'll be around, and we, we'll be able to answer your questions tomorrow. Yes, we have the time right now for one or two questions. Okay. There is one person. Hugo. Ah. We go in front. Um, so this might be actually a quite vague question, and you might want to go for more specific ones. Though you mentioned unit tests for, well, a multimedia framework, and I just would like to know more about what approach did you take for this? Um, basically, every time we write a new module, by module I, ha I have pipe, every time we write a pipe, we have a unit test associated with that, that uh, will send control commands to it, we try to fit data into it, um, fixed data or randomly generated data, and um, we check if the output is well, the same as what is supposed to be defined. Um, and if it changes, it's considered to be an error. Or if there is a memory leak detected by Valgrin, it's also supposed to be an error. So that's for pipes. Now we also have a lot of source files that uh, implement well, buffer management or, or UPump. And these, for UPump, for instance, it's tested by having a unit test that forks several threads and uh, tries to well, send packets to different queues that will be read by different threads. And uh, we, will, we check that we receive all buffers in the correct order uh, and that we do not leak anything and so on. So um, the, interest, the interest of, um, of the framework is that every module is very autonomous. So you don't have to import uh, thousands of lines of uh, support code to run them. Uh, just a few headers are, um, are needed to to, to, to be able to test the modules you're writing. Thank you very much. You're welcome.